Uh, so, the big idea that I would like to tell you about tonight is that we can understand the incredibly complicated mathematics that is behind quantum computing using remarkably simple coloured diagrams. And the idea is that the mathematics is difficult, but the diagrams I could, I could show to anybody in the, in the room. So, I'm not going to say a lot about quantum computing itself because I'm not a computer scientist and I'm not a, uh, an engineer. I don't build computers. But let me just tell you a little bit about why they're going to be so important. I mean, quantum computers are going to be the next generation of computers. They're going to be the computers that, that, that bust open the problems that at, the, at present we find intractable. Uh, there are algorithms for quantum computers that can break some of the strongest cryptographic systems that we know at present. And the advent of quantum computing is going to force us to develop whole new uh, encryption algorithms. Perhaps even more importantly, quantum computers are the perfect system for modeling and, uh, and uh, simulating quantum systems. I mean, what better way to simulate a quantum system and understand what it's going to do than with a quantum system? So <coughs> I want to tell you about the mathematics behind quantum computing and, and how we're going to revolutionize that. So when we think about the very small scale of the universe, about what happens at the atomic level, the picture that most of us have in our mind is, is this one with the balls and the electrons spinning around them. And it's a remarkably uh, useful picture from the point of view of intuition, but if there's one thing that quantum physics has taught us over the last 50 years, is that if we're thinking at this level, our intuition is almost always completely wrong. And this is a very good example. Uh, the universe looks nothing like this at the scale of atoms. We just think it does. It's, it's a handy mnemonic. It's a handy way to think about what goes on. So let me give you an example of why the universe is, is so much stranger than what we're, we're seeing in this, in this picture. So let's think about light, something as simple as light. We see it all the time, we interact with it regularly. Is light made up of particles or is it made up of waves? And this was a question that people were asking themselves early in the 20th century and they devised some ideas, some experiments as to how to decide whether it's a particle or a wave. So I want you to imagine for a second some waves moving across the ocean towards a break wall and there's two gaps in the break wall. So the ra waves are moving in parallel when they hit the break wall. But then when they hit it, they go through these little gaps and they start spreading out in concentric circles. They no longer move in a straight line. And then they start doing something very in interesting. They interact with one another. So where two crests of a wave meet, you get a very tall crest. And where two troughs of a wave meet, you get a very deep trough. And where a crest hits a trough, it sort of evens out and you get, you get a, a flat bit of ocean for a second. So if you expect that light acts like a wave, then you expect to see a pattern like the blue picture over there, uh, the blue picture on the, on the left of the slide, when light moves through two slits, because you want to see, you expect to see the waves of light cancelling one another in some places and reinforcing one another in other places. On the other hand, you might think that light behaves like a particle, and if you think that, then you should imagine throwing tennis balls at a wall with two holes in it. If you throw tennis balls at a wall, they're going to go through one of the holes or the other, and they're going to hit the wall on the other side in more or less a straight line. So you would expect to see two very dense patches of tennis balls and they're not much to either side. There wouldn't be any of this interesting pattern. So the picture here tells you that light behaves like a, a wave because this is an experiment that's being done and this is what the light, light does, except that it doesn't really. So you can actually, we've, I mean, we're, we're sufficiently uh, advanced in our, in our technology that we can detect individual photons and if you look for individual photons, you see them and they hit the wall one at a time. But if you fire the photons through one after another after another and keep track of where they all landed, the distribution of photons looks like this. So what's happening is the photons are moving through both holes at once. Each individual photon is going through both holes at once and then interfering with itself on the other side. It's completely bizarre. But that's the effect of the experiment. Even more bizarre, if we look to see which slit the photon's going through to decide what's going on, they stop doing this. It's like the universe is playing hide and seek with us. And now it just behaves like we're throwing tennis balls. It stops doing this crazy thing. It's really quite, quite surprising. Um, so just to give you some idea of how bizarre that is, I've got a picture of the, of the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment up there. So now imagine that you've got something quantum in a box, so this is like radioactive decay, and you've got a photoelectric sensor that picks up a, a radioactive particle if it's emitted, and if the particle is picked up, it drops a hammer on a vial of something nasty, and there's a cat in the box, so if the detector picks up a photon, the cat dies. If it doesn't, the cat doesn't die. And what quantum physics tells us is, until we look in the box, the cat's both alive and dead at the same time. Seems a little ridiculous, but that is the best model we have for what's going on. 
The point of all this is that this sort of strange superposition of states and interaction is crucial to quantum computing. This is how quantum computers are going to work. And I've got a diagram in here of what happens to the energy, le energy levels of electrons in a magnetic field at very low temperatures. This is predicted by quantum physics. And you can see that they only occur at very specific uh, energy levels. This gives us a lot of control over how quantum computers are going to work. It's going to be crucial to making them work. All right, so obviously we're going to need some pretty sophisticated mathematics to deal with this. It's not tractable by the mathematics that we had. But fortunately, a lot of mathematicians are being, doing what mathematicians do best, which is this up here, standing around, doing calculations, thinking about ideas that they knew somehow were going to be important, although they didn't perhaps know quite yet exactly what they were going to be important for. Uh, thinking about basic level research, they didn't yet know about quantum computing. What they knew was that these mathematical ideas seemed to be significant, and they'd worked on them. So when quantum physics came along, it turned out that we had the mathematics to deal with it, and that mathematics is called operator algebra. Operator algebra was originally developed to deal with uh, strange topological spaces. Like the, so this is like this, uh, this picture of a bottle that you see over on the left. And if, you're, uh, if you don't want to pay too much attention to me, I encourage you just to watch these arrows moving around the bottle. This is a bottle that only has an inside, or only has an outside. You get to choose which. This is called a Klein bottle. Operator algebras were developed to understand topological problems, of which this is a, an example. But it turned out that there was, in particular, a very uh, special operator algebra called the Irrational Rotation Algebra, which generates this beautiful blue and red picture called the Hofstadter butterfly. This picture describes exactly the energy levels that we saw for the electrons in a magnetic field on the previous slide. So going up and down the picture, we have the strength of the magnetic field. Going back and forth across the picture, we have temperature. And then what we're seeing in the colours is the energy level of the photon. So blue is high energy, red is low energy. And you see these discrete states that it can be in. So it turns out that operator algebra is excellent for modelling this sort of thing. OK, what's the downside? The downside is that operator algebra is also very, very complicated. And if we just want to describe how operator algebra works, the way that we think of calculus, for example, we need some sort of intuitive handle on it. Now, for calculus, we draw pictures. We draw a graph, and we look at the area under the graph, or the slope of the graph, and this tells us something. We need a similar sort of a model for operator algebra if we're going to be able to really study these quantum systems and get our, our, our minds around them. So that's where we were at. And I remember early in, uh, early in just maybe 2001, I was at a conference, and one of the big names in operator algebra, George Eliot, was giving a talk. And he put up a picture of a galaxy not dissimilar to the one on the left there. And he opened his talk by saying, I want you to tell me what you think that I think that this looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Which seemed like a strange, uh, strange introduction to a talk. Of course, the answer was, well, perhaps not of course the answer was, the answer was he thought this looked like the irrational rotation algebra, this rotation algebra that I was telling you about. And for me, this was a bit of an eye-opener because I have no idea why he thinks that looks like the irrational rotation algebra. This was his intuition for it. But it occurred to me that this meant that we didn't have good visual pictures for these operator algebras. We didn't have some sort of intuitive handle on what they were doing. Uh, as a result of questions like this, um, a research program was begun by researchers here at Wollongong trying to write down visual pictures for operator algebras. It goes back to before my time. And the original idea was to describe operator algebras using diagrams, just consisting of dots and arrows. The original diagrams did a very good job of describing a lot of operator algebras, but we were able to prove that they couldn't capture the irrational rotation algebra. And this was clearly a crucial example for us. I um, am involved, I became involved in this project when we started thinking about ways to modify the diagrams. And they're a bit more complicated. They have different colours in them, and this represents different dimensions sort of interacting with one another. The point is that the diagrams encode complicated information, but the diagrams themselves are quite simple. The rules for constructing them are relatively straightforward, and we can manipulate them you know, by drawing on paper. So I want to close by telling you about this diagram. This is one of the earliest ones that we came up with. So over on the, on the left there, you see an, animated, um, uh, an animation that's describing a topological space known as a solenoid. So imagine taking an infinitely stretchy rubber band and stretching it out and twisting it and turning it on itself then doing that again, and then doing that again, infinitely many times. It turns out that this is an excellent operator algebraic model for an adding machine. And if we want computers to do anything, we certainly want them to be able to add. Right? So this is an excellent operator algebraic model for an adding machine. What we wanted to do was to write down a picture for this adding machine so that we could really analyse it. And after a fair bit of work, we came up with 
what in retrospect seems like an obvious picture to have written down. I mean, you can even see the twisting of the rubber band over and over on top of itself here. But it turns out that this picture encodes exactly the operator algebra that we were interested in. Using similar techniques, we've since found excellent models for the irrational rotation algebra, and it's led to huge advances in our understanding of, of that C-star algebra, of that operator algebra, and therefore the, uh, the sort of quantum mechanics that it encodes. So I guess that's the, the punchline. We really believe that these diagrams can be our un of the way that we understand operator algebras in the future, and we think that they can be a means of encoding quantum algorithms pictorially.